start with the final talk of the morning session with uh, Sanjay Rampula on applied holographic mathematics. Right, so this is a continuation of uh, this theme that I started talking about uh, on Friday, uh, where uh, some developments basically, what I mean by holographic mathematics is basically some uh, developments in our understanding of uh, matrix models, uh, you know, generalizing what we know about unitary one matrix model to either multi matrix models. Or today there will be another generalization of unitary one matrix models that we will be exploring. Uh, and this has applications in uh, computational linguistics. Um, so, great. Uh, so that's uh, based on the paper that I wrote with uh, Dimitri Kotsakis and Manush Sakrazadi. They are computer scientists at uh, Queen Mary, and uh, so they were looking at some data in language, uh, and uh, I explained some of their thinking about this data and how the matrix theory perspective sort of informs how one can have, uh, sort of informs a new perspective on that data. Um, so. Yeah, just a brief recap of what happened in the first lecture. What we saw there was that uh, there is an algebra which I call ANM, uh, which is a nice associative <coughs> algebra with a non-degenerate pairing. Uh, and that algebra controls the combinatorics of two matrix correlators uh, and it seems to know a lot about Littlewood Richardson coefficients, this algebra. Uh, and it is used in the derivation of an identity which turned out to be a crucial ingredient in the derivation of a bound that was of interest in quantum, quantum information theory. So this bound was related to some notion of approximate cloning of operators. Uh, and there was a procedure called uh, storage and retrieval of a unitary operator and there's something called a procedure called perfect probabilistic reconstruction, and there's a probability there. And in order to find the bound, the best probability you can get, uh, it was useful to understand an identity that involved these Littlewood Richardson coefficients. Uh, it involved Littlewood Richardson coefficients alongside some dimensions of irreps of symmetric groups uh, and the contents of Young diagrams. Uh, and it turned out that this was. Um, uh, it was possible to, to give a nice derivation and to generalize this using this algebra. So, uh, and this algebra was an algebra coming from permutations. So this was sort of a this algebra. You know, the interest in this algebra comes from the fact that it is a, related to two matrix problems. And two matrix problem. This was a two matrix problem with unitary symmetry. Uh, and obvious, obviously, if you have a one matrix problem, it's a simpler problem. Uh, and this is a two matrix generalization of the one matrix UD symmetric uh, problem. And it has applications here, uh, which we just uh, briefly reviewed. So today we'll talk about another kind of generalization of the one matrix model with UD symmetry. But instead, we'll think about symmetric group symmetry. So instead of continuous UD symmetry will impose that our observables will have SD symmetry. And yes, this application is inspired by, this development is inspired by computational linguistics. And it is, uh, so that the way we use these matrix models to understand this data is inspired by how traditionally one has used UD invariant or SOD, SPD invariant one matrix models in understanding large data sets uh, in the context of nuclear or particle physics. So we have large matrices in linguistics. Uh, and how does that arise? And why are people interested in this? So this is part of a subject called, well, it is part of computational linguistics. Uh, and more specifically, what is called compositional distributional semantics. So distributional semantics is the long way of talking about uh, word vectors. So 
So you may have heard about word vectors or word to vec that Google algorithms have, and Vishnu uh, uh, has written papers on uh, word to vec. So it's sort of more familiar language for this is word vectors. So I'll explain a little bit what that involves. And then there is a notion of compositionality, which uh, the, these my colleagues were interested in, which had led them to associate matrices to class to, to different words. You look at a large list of words, and for each of these words, you have a matrix. Uh, and that's part of this compositional distribution or semantics. Now, random matrix theory, of course, we know a lot about this uh, from theoretical physics, from applied physics as well, which is used to study statistics uh, of large collections of matrices. Um, so what we did in that first paper with uh, those two computer science collaborators is to sort of develop, to motivate and develop sort of Gaussian matrix distributions constrained by permutation symmetry. And we did some calculations in that model using techniques similar to Euclidean quantum field theory. Uh, in fact, identical to Euclidean quantum field theory. So statistics, of course, we know is zero-dimensional quantum field theory. Uh, and hence, uh, this construction uh, borrows techniques from quantum field theory. And this theory is compared to data, and, uh, and as we will show, they, they, this way of looking at things suggests that there are certain aspects of these matrices one should focus on, uh, and this could be useful as signatures for applications to linguistics, in the sense of each language will come with a signature uh, that is motivated by this kind of thinking about the matrices. So what is distributional semantics? So the idea is that uh, the meaning of a word is captured by the contexts in which it occurs. This idea was developed by linguists uh, in the 50s. Um, and the way it works is that one constructs vectors for words uh, by looking at the frequencies with which these words occur in the vicinity of a specified set of context words. So you have a, a body, a collection of books, uh, and you pick a set of words which you're going to call context words. Uh, and then, so as an example, let's say I, I could be interested in a small uh, piece of literature or it's a collection of books. I could have words, for example, pet, uh, which I'm going to use as what are called context words. Uh, and let's say these are two context words. Then you think about all the other words, and uh, for example, you could have uh, the word dog. Uh, and you, in your collection of writing, you find where is it that dog occurs near pet? Maybe you might expect that will occur fairly frequently. So let's say this occurs a hundred times. And you feed, uh, that occurs next. So by next to, I mean nearby, within a window of about five words. So you have, let's say, 89 times. Let's say you have a word like cat. Okay, maybe that appears 110, uh, I don't know, 112. Something like that. These words will occur frequently. And then let's suppose you have something like a word uh, such as baby. You know, it will not occur, baby will not occur too frequently with pet, but uh, uh, it might occur frequently with, uh, you know, with, with feed. So the idea is that you can replace uh, the word by these vectors and that these vectors know something about the meaning of the word. Uh, so, so we're going to try and work with these vectors uh, to understand meaning. So that's the basic idea of distributional semantics. You build vectors and you try to study the vectors, do mathematics with the vectors or computations with the vectors to extract the meaning of things. So for example, as we just illustrated, these vectors can be used in some computational tasks, such as comparing word similarity. You could try and get a computer to understand how similar words are by letting it look at these vectors. 
Now that's distributional semantics. So compositional distributional semantics. Sorry. Yeah. So here you have to define what you mean by vicinity, right? Yeah. So you have so there is a sort of standard sort of five word to the left and right, which has been used by these guys. And you know these guys have a lot of experience, and they 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 they've, they've thought about what is a good window to use, and then they just put it in, let the computer work, and see if this plus or minus five is a good thing to do to get the computer to understand word similarity as well as humans do. So it is a task in artificial intelligence, and there is some law for how to do it. For bits of relative uh, notion, I mean, uh, dog is more uh, referred to cat, I mean, or maybe they pick the word which has the highest occurrences in the window that you define, and then the other words are referred uh, as frequent or not frequent relatively to this. So, so you would pick some words, you know, so, that means, why not know what, what does it mean? I mean, if you take uh, 10 times more books, yes. it would be probably 10 times more than 100, or I don't know. Uh, absolutely, yeah, so. absolutely. So, so, so the comparison is between, you know, how, that's right. So if you, so if, if you want to pr properly define these measures, you have to think about how to normalize these. So it's like a finest, basically. Yeah. Okay. So, so there will be a space, but, you know, exactly how you construct the eventual entries of the matrix and different algorithms and, and but that, that's a basic crop idea. So, so when you start with this vector, the dimension of the vector is infinite or depending it's on finite, the It's finite, finite. This will be words. finite. You, you will pick, I don't know, some fairly frequently occurring words because if you pick a rare word, you know, it, it won't reflect the nature of the language. It would reflect its own rarity. So, so you pick some fairly frequent uh, words and then you use that as a basis to think about all the other words. Again, not all the other words. Again, fairly frequently occurring words. So you have meaningful data. But that choice of your basis, is that a human choice or the computer can figure out I think which words are the a, best to use? Well, you know, you, you could, if you're picking, you, you sort of first uh, tabulate the frequencies of all the words and then pick somewhere in the middle of that range. So you just fix the range, you, you put in the range and then the rest is done by the computer. Well, you have to be careful because some, some words are more grammar than, than, than meaning, right? So. Yeah, you have to exclude, of course. But yeah, no, so you say that, that's what you make it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah like, like certain things you would avoid. Yeah. <laughs> so, so good. So, so that's the rough idea. And then, you know, Sandra, that's my collaborator with Mary. This guy, she was a kind of lecturer or postdoc at Oxford before, and this was some work done by the Oxford group on quantum, uh, that works on quantum stuff in connection to artificial intelligence and so on. And uh, so they, they have a, they had this paper called compositional distributional semantics, where they observed that kind of existing formal models of com grammatical composition had some mathematical similarities uh, to composition that physicists are familiar with, how matrices combine with vectors to produce other vectors, tenses combine with matrices, and so on. Uh, and their idea was, therefore, that uh, you can construct the meaning of sentences uh, by composing the meaning of the constituent words. And a good way to do that in the framework they proposed was to use the kinds of composition that exists in the world of vectors, matrices, and higher rank tensors. Therefore, rather than just associating vectors to words, one should also associate matrices and higher rank tensors uh, to different kinds of words depending on their grammatical type. And then uh, some of the approach, the, the different ways they, they propose how, how to approach this construction of matrices, let's say. One of them was based on linear, multilinear regression. There was a bit of work on explicitly building databases of these matrices, uh, depending on what algorithm you choose, one, one, of these, one of the algorithms. So how does this work, this linear regression? So you take a noun. So, so basically, what's going to happen here is nouns are going to be vectors and adjectives are going to be matrices. So you take, the way that works is take a noun, such as car, you build a vector for it, and then take a, what is called a noun phrase, <coughs> which is a noun modified by an adjective to form another noun phrase, a noun-like thing. Uh, and what you do is you want to find, so this is a, a known vector constructed, as we said, by frequency. This is another known vector con constructed by looking at its frequencies in the presence of other context words. And then you say, can I 
find a matrix which maps this uh, car vector to the red car vector. And then you do that with other words, car and other things, and you find the best possible matrix that will map the x's or the nouns to red x's. And uh, you find a matrix red which gives the best fit using with linear regression, uh, and you therefore build a matrix for red. And similarly, you go through different adjectives and you build matrices for adjectives. So the outcome is a list of matrices for adjectives. Some technicality about how big the list is and so on, having to do with you want to make sure that there's enough data uh, to think to do uh, meaningful statistics. Great, but, but for, for us physicists, this is the interesting thing. There is a list of matrices for adjectives. And the, the, the focus of our paper, this linguistic matrix theory thing, was to study the statistics of matrices associated to adjectives. You could also do this with verbs. Uh, and uh, the, the idea was to look at these matrices, which are very big, because the, the number, the size of the matrices is related to the number of context words. And you can do different setups where the size can be up to 2,000. Or it could be a few hundred, and then you can do it in steps, so increasing up to 2,000. And then the number of these adjectives we were looking at had to do with a few hundreds. Again, these computational linguists know what is a reasonable sort of set of numbers to choose for this data. Uh, now we want to understand what is the nature of the statistics. And you know, we have big matrices, large numbers of entries. How do you make sense of, you don't, we don't want to look at the statistics of every single one of them and think about them, it's too much to think about. So rather, we want to use ideas from random matrix theory, uh, which started from the work of Wigner and Dyson, who were trying to model the energy levels of complex nuclei. And uh, they have kind of uh, uncovered some universal features uh, in the energy level distributions of complex nuclei. So of course, energy levels of complex nuclei have to do with matrices, because this is a uh, Hermitian Hamiltonian, and uh, solving different Hamiltonians give you different spectra, and then you want to know something about the nature of the statistics of energy levels of a complex nucleus that you can't directly solve. So energy level repulsion, that's one of the qualitative features that uh, is observed in data, and what these guys found is that this energy level repulsion uh, was, uh, some, was a characteristic of very simple Gaussian matrix models. And this kind of features have been found in lots of other things, nuclei, molecules, and other applications of physics or even applied mathematics, financial correlation matrices, and so on. Um, good. Excuse me, I missed a bit. So, so what is the meaning of the distribution of the matrix elements in linguistics? Like if you have a matrix which is very homogeneous versus one that's very... So, so it's like looking at, at for example, trace of, trace of matrix, or trace of the square of a matrix, uh, and going through the sample of all the adjectives, you want to know what does trace m square look like. Plot that in a histogram, trace m square is here, you know, there's a histogram, and what is the distribution. But in, in the end, that helps you interpret the meaning of the text that you're reading. Uh, that, well, that's a connection not basically. really. Not, not, yeah. No, no. So, so this kind of stepping back from the original applications and just looking at this data as a physicist. Okay. okay. But so with the hope of eventually, eventually something eventually, about eventually, semantics of the text. Right. Eventually, text. Uh, it's about. Uh, yeah. So basically, there's a meaningful collection of matrices. First, we want to understand the statistics. Uh, and uh, so, just to remind ourselves, what do these things look like? You are integrating uh, the simplest matrix integrals. You have an integral of a Hermitian matrix. Uh, you can calculate, you, you have a Gaussian uh, measure. You, you can calculate correlators, or you can calculate eigenvalue distributions. Uh, and these simple things uh, have unitary symmetry. So m transforms to u m u dagger, and trace m squares in that. And in physics, this unitarity invariance corresponds to base changes in the Hilbert space. Uh, now, in the context of the linguistic application, you have this large dimensional vector space. You know, there's no obvious reason why there is, you know, OD symmetry or UD symmetry of continuous rotations in this big 
space of vacuum, big space of uh, context works. Uh, so in fact, you can look at, I mean, some of the things people study about these factors, which are two word factors. Uh, one of the things they do, they look at in order to compare the similarity of them, is take an inner product. And uh, now, this is kind of an OD invariant quantity. It is invariant in the continuous symmetries, uh, just a dot product. But there are other things they do with these word vectors. For example, they want to know whether the, the word described by P and the word described by Q have some sort of relationship having to do with does the word, the first word, entail the second word. So some sort of grammatical notions. And then some, one of the things they use is this callback to Leibler divergence. Uh, now this is a thing which is not OD invariant, but it is SD invariant. So, so some of the meaningful information is a reduced symmetry. So in other words, if I, if I uh, you know, do a basis change here, and instead of 189, I have 89, 100, 112, 110, and so on, this kind of reshuffling of the context word should be a symmetry uh, of the meaningful things we're trying to extract from these numbers. Right, that sounds pretty reasonable. Uh, so, uh, so permutation symmetry seems uh, a plausible thing to think about. Uh, and the next thing, you know, the simplest Gaussian model, uh, matrix models we know are Gaussians. So the, so the first thing we tried to do was look at these matrices. Let's say you have matrices of size 2,000 by 2,000. Look at one matrix entry, one what particular IJ matrix entry, and look at what values it takes. And there's a range of values, there's a maximum. So we convinced ourselves they do look roughly Gaussian. So Gaussians are expected quite generally, and, and, and we convinced ourselves. For this linear regression models, at least, they, they were approximate Gaussians. So we have two ingredients, Gaussians and uh, permutation symmetry. So we go back to the simplest models that we can think about. Uh, so you know you have to you have to think about matrix models where you have this usual measure PM for all the matrix elements, and then uh, there are two kinds of uh, invariant. So whereas we had trace M as a linear invariant when we have UN invariant things. Here you have two linear invariants. You can take the sum over all the diagonal, uh, which is in fact trace m. But if you just take the sum over all the off diagonal, that is also permutation invariant. Because if I take i to sigma of i and at the same time j to sigma of j, this quantity is invariant. It just amounts to reordering the sums. So, so there are, there are the polynomial function, the linear functions of m, which are invariant, there are two linearly independent things, which are permutation invariant. Uh, very explicitly, this is what they are. Now you start thinking about quadratic. What are some of the obvious quadratic invariants? Some of our mi square, uh, just the sum of squares of all the diagonal. If you permute the i's, you can relabel the sum, and you get something which is invariant. Uh, and then you can do something similar with the off-diagonal elements. Basically, it's sort of things like some I m i i square, some i not equal to j m i j square, or m i j m j i. Uh, these are all invariant things. If I take a mute i to sigma of i, this will be invariant. So, it's so here, here's the simplest thing one could think of: is uh, take these quadratic permutation invariant functions. Uh, and this is kind of the generalization of trace and square. Because there are three things here. Uh, you can, uh, we have three parameters, lambda, A, and B. So here's a matrix model which depends on five parameters, two linear ones, and three quadratic ones. And all these functions that appear in the exponent are permutation invariant in this sense. And you can take permutation invariant functions of matrices and compute their correlators. Put that in, in this uh, integral, divide by one over z, and you get a, an expectation value. Uh, and that you can compare with an experimental expectation value. You sum, take this function of m, uh, take the, this, evaluate this function on a given word, sum over all the words, divide by the number of words, that is the experimental expectation value. And you try to see if uh, your theory correctly 
uh, reproduces these things. Uh, so we have these linear averages, these quadratic averages. Again, this is experimental stuff, which uh, once you know them from the experiment, you can go back and fix the parameters of the model. The Gaussian is determined by the mean and the dispersion. Here we have two means, two permutation invariant means, three dispersions. So once you know these dispersions from the data, you can fix what these five parameters are. So once you fix the Gaussian model, then you can, well, this is roughly what they look like. Uh, interestingly, these parameters, they have some simple scaling behaviors with, uh, as you increase d, for example, lambda over d square or a over d square and so on, uh, tend to approach a constant. D is a number of uh, context words? Number of context words. So it'd be nice to understand if you guys can build a model to explain this. Uh, that'd be interesting. Is this data or what is this? This is from data, yeah. Okay. From, from texts? Yeah, from, from texts, yeah. So, so there is a corpus, it's called a collection, you know, all online written things, and these guys know how to access this and compute these expectation values and get the parameters of the model. So if you say you're pretty much saying, Say you put the, the word red, you say all the nouns that kind of say dog and yeah. then cat. Yeah. If you take like the trace of m squared or something like that. That's right. That's you kind of like finding second neighbors when you do this. Uh, so yeah, so you could go back, you try to interpret M I J M J I. Mm -hmm. That's right, the I's and J's are labeled by sort of in this Buffets. example fat and feed. Yeah. yeah. And and you are sort of yeah. So yeah, indeed it'll be good to think about exactly what these uh, polynomial invariants mean, uh, but they will mean something. But sorry, is this saying that a Gaussian model is a good approximation? Well, we have not yet. So first of all, it's saying there are interesting permutation invariant Gaussian signatures, which are these are. So, so for each collection of text, you have five parameters. And you say, this is where my collection sits. And you can use that to compare it with something else. And so but the next thing is, does the Gaussian actually predict anything? To do that, you, you use your uh, our model. Uh, in the Gaussian model, you have some expectation values, cubic, let's say. You can compute them using Wick's theorem. Uh, here, this you would involve some quadratic one times the linear one, another quadratic times linear, and so on. And uh, you just calculate this. And, uh, and then you go back and calculate the same expectation values from the data, and you say, how well does the theory compare to the data? Uh, OK, so the theory, in this case, for some of these observables were like they were forty percent off. So for theories, that's a great agreement, right? So so great. So so we have. Uh, <laughs> so, so, so this is great great agreement. And, and then for some of the other observables, uh, you find that uh, you know uh, the ratio is, is a fraction. You know, it's about a really tiny. But you know also you know what is a good ex what is a good agreement? When we say, for example, in, in distributional semantics, uh, distributional semantics. So correctly allows artificial intelligence to understand word similarity. There's a certain level of accuracy. So, so if you're getting 60%, that's sort of ballpark what they, they, they get in distributional semantics. So, so it's, not, it's not far off uh, what is a reasonable thing. Uh, but OK. Uh, and you use similar things for adjectives and verbs. Sorry, does this mean that a robot will do the right thing like 60% of the times? That's right. That's right. On, on the particular task of word similarity. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> and uh, so great. We so, shouldn't be afraid. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. This is a very particular way of doing it. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so good. So, so, so the, you know, so it turns out, of course, from a and uh, from a mathematical a sort of physicist point of view, this five parameter Gaussian is actually a subclass of a full 13 parameter family of Gaussians. So we use two linear invariants, we put in the, the three that we could think of in the first instance. Uh, and uh, so, really, really, in fact, the, there's the, most, the most general Gaussian really is a 13 parameter family. Uh, and uh, so, this motivates a deeper study of this thing. So, what are these 13 parameters? There were two linear. Uh, and then there are, in fact, 11 quadratic invariants. This MII square, for each of these invariants, you can associate a graph. So there's a connection between counting these invariants uh, and counting graphs, directed graphs, basically, where each M corresponds to one of these edges, 
M and the nodes correspond to one index. MII, MII, that's this one. MIJ, MIJ is this one. And then you draw all the different graphs you can. There's a typo here. This should be MIJ, MJK. Uh, but uh, these are, there's a set of independent, uh, 11 independent functions. So, you know, so that, that first paper will finish it by saying, well, okay, maybe if we had looked at the full 13 parameter Gaussians, maybe we would get consistently near 60%. Okay. And the paper somewhat. So, okay, so, uh, so that's what uh, we did. And the summary of this part one was that um, we have described some permutation invariant Gaussian matrix theory, which are useful in order to study uh, matrices in compositional distributional semantics. We compared the theory with the data, and we found that this is sort of promising as a uh, way to try and make sense of this. Interestingly, the focus on our calculations was on was not on eigenvalues. You know, in the case of the traditional Dignard Dyson application, you're looking at eigenvalue distributions. Uh, and partly because you can use unitary symmetry to diagonalize general emission matrices. Here we only have a discrete symmetry, so eigenvalues are not the obvious thing to think about. But now, you know, we are people who work on ADS CFT, we like correlators, so this is an actually a natural thing to think about in this context, because they will be a richer set of observables than eigenvalue distributions. Have you looked at the eigenvalue distributions? Just uh, well, you see, these are general real matrices, so they're not always real, they may not all be diagonalizable, so they could be Jordan blocks and so on. So, yeah, so you, we haven't looked at it, but you, you could. Uh, but, uh, yeah, one could look at that as well. And uh, the proposal was that, okay, here's a nice 13 dimensional space of quadratic invariance. One should look at that as a, way, as a signature to compare the characteristics of different corpora, different collections of text. Uh, and the idea was to go further and solve this 13 dimensional theory and apply it to data and, and come back to, to, to data. So, so the second part of the talk is where you know, uh, there's a, there was a follow-up paper where, in fact, a lot of this can be done. So you, you can make a lot of progress with this 13-parameter uh, uh, model. Uh, in fact, so the first thing, and in order to make progress with the 13-parameter model, you need to go back to representation theory to count these invariant polynomials that I just showed you. Uh, so I will show you how you can get nice counting formulas for these invariant polynomials using representation theory of SD, the symmetric group. Uh, and then I will take a closer look at the quadratic invariants using representation theory, and then show you how this can be used to start making calculations in this Gaussian model. So if you're counting degree k polynomial invariants of a matrix, uh, and remember, the, the symmetry we are interested in is sort of M is transforming to sigma, tra sigma as a linear operator, sigma transpose M sigma. You want things to be invariant under that. Uh, and that, in terms of the matrix indices, is Mij goes to M sigma of I, M sigma, sorry, sigma of I, M, M sigma of I, sigma of J. So what's happening here basically is if you if we think about one vector space, the uh, i, i goes from 1 to d. In fact, you can think about that as the space of context words. You have, uh, you're permuting these guys. So this is a d-dimensional representation of the symmetric group. It is, in fact, what is called the natural representation of SD, just by acting uh, in the natural way, uh, which follows from the definition of permutations. Permutations are reordering and you have a set of D basis vectors, you reorder them, that's an action on the vector space. So what the Mij is, is basically D times D uh, quantities, and as a representation of the sigmas, this is just the usual representation Vd, tensor Vd. Because what is Vd tensor Vd? Vd is uh, D-dimensional tensor D-dimensional, it's a dimension <coughs> D square, uh, and when you take the tensor product, the permutation acts diagonally, so sigma tensor sigma. So basically, as a representation, the, li the, the linear combinations of Mij form Vd tensor Vd. And if you take uh, tensor product of k copies, so if you have degree k polynomials, so you have something like 
m uh, i1 uh, j1 up to m i k j k, that's the same thing as taking vd tensor vd, which is the m i j, but then tensoring it k times, but then projecting into the symmetric part because these are commuting variables. So to think about polynomial invariance, you can think about the tensor product and then project to the symmetric part. That's just a general thing about polynomials. They are in subspace, polynomials of a fixed degree. They are the subspace of the tensor product. And the, the nice thing about, about thinking about this is that the character of the tensor product is easy to work out. It's a product of characters. And then you just have to apply the symmetrization. So, so just to, uh, so we're going to use character theory as uh, you know, was used in conformal group uh, by Nicholas on Friday. Uh, and we can do the counting of this SD invariance using the character theory of SD. The first observation is that what is the character of a permutation in this fundament, in this defining representation? It turns out it's something very simple. It's the number of one cycles in that permutation. Now you have the k-fold tensor product of VD tensor VD, uh, and the permutation SD will act as sigma tensor sigma tensor k times. Uh, because there's sigma tensor sigma acts on Mij, and then you have k-fold tensor product of that. Uh, and then if you count degree k invariance, there are two symmetric groups involved. One of them was the SD, which permutes the basis vectors, and there's a sigma tensor sigma. So instead of writing Mij, I've written a basis E for Vd, Vd tensor Vd, uh, and uh, there's k-fold tensor product of that. And this is how sigma tensor sigma acts. And you can unpack it in the in indices and so on. And what is the, there's another symmetric group which is SK, because you have polynomials of degree K. And VD tensor VD K times, how does tau act? Well, it takes this, you know, this is the first pair, the second pair, the kth pair. Uh, the tau swaps the first with the second, for example. So it kind of acts on the pair. So there's an explicit formula how the SK acts. And there is an explicit formula for how the SD acts. Once you have those, you have uh, uh, this tensor product space. You just have to apply to count the space of invariance. You just project it. So you project to the invariant subspace of SK to the invariant subspace of SD. And there's an explicit formula. To project to the invariant of anything, you just sum over the group elements. And that's what you do. Sanjay, yeah. was it not a symmetric uh, k-fold product that you consider? That's right. Okay. K-fold because I'm just looking at po polynomials of degree k. Okay. And then in, in general, I'll take k, all possible k. I want to construct a sequence. For given k, you know that uh, it's also needed a symmetric tensor product. That's right. So the second uh, symmetric group, group action that you described there, yeah. you know that already is symmetric. It, that's right. That's right. That's right. So that, that's, yeah. In, in fact, yeah. So the sigma is some kind of physical choice. But uh, the, the SK, just from the fact that we look at polynomial invariants. So it, it's there. Uh, and then you, this character formula, you can simplify it. There are a sum over two permutations. It becomes a sum over two conjugacy classes. There are some usual symmetry factors associated with these things. Uh, and then there is some thing that you can work out. This, this kind of follows by working out the implications of this fact that trace of a, of a sigma is the number of one cycle, but trace of sigma square, you have to think about what are the one cycles in sigma square, and things like that. And, and, and this, thing, so this leads to a uh, product of a k of the divisors and, and so on. So, yeah. Sigma is in SK and tau is in SD. Sigma is in SD, tau is in SK. SK. Uh, and, and you can work, work out what this implies. And very, very explicit thing. Now, you can do this for any SD and any SK, and here I've simplified it for D being specifically 2. Why have I done that? You see, this, this counting, which is a function of two parameters, you can expect it from experience with matrix theory, but when you have large D, so SD is like UD, when you have large D, uh, there'll be a counting that is independent of D. Uh, at large D, you know, for example, if you have degree k polynomials for trace m's, it's partitions of k. So just, just a number of multi-traces with k matrices. So for large d, this number will be independent of d. 
And to get that d independent number, d has to be sufficiently large. And in fact, d equals 2k will work. So if you think about it. Uh, so this is the simplest formula for the sequence. Great, so, so you can work out what these sequences are. Uh, in fact, it's the sequence of these kind of directed multigraphs. It is recognized by the online encyclopedia. Uh, two linear invariants, 11 quadratic invariants, 52 are cubic, and, and so on. And it's interesting to compare this with the one matrix UD invariants, where you are counting partitions. If you have k copies of m, uh, you have multi traces, you can partition the k different m's into single or multi, double, and so on traces. So partitions is, is what counts. So this is kind of the S. Kind of SD version of counting partition. This is what the observables, that's the sequence of. Basically, it grows a lot faster than the counting of partitions. As expected, you've reduced the symmetry from UD to SD, so the invariants have increased. Uh, and it's just fun to compare. You find that it actually grows a lot faster than uh, two matrix UD invariants as well. And, and upon a close, rough inspection, one sort of sees that these numbers seem to grow about as fast as three index tensor invariants. So you can compare. That's another kind of invariant theory problem. So it'd be nice to estimate exactly how fast this is going. So uh, anyway, so we, we understand the counting. There are two linear parameters and there are 11 quadratic parameters. So what we would like to do as a statistical, as a statistician, you might say, let's try and take this uh, Gaussian measure, this DM, First question is, okay, here's this 11 parameter space here. Where does this converge? So we have to think about when does that converge? Uh, when does this Gaussian integral converge? And can we use this model, this 13 parameter model, to get some expectation values of quadratic and cubic invariants and so on? And this question can be nicely answered not by methods of statistics, but by methods of representation theory. So uh, you go back to these quadrat, these MIJs. Uh, you think about MIJ as VD density VD, uh, and we think about uh, how does this transform under the diagonal SD action, and how do we decompose it into irreducible representations? Because this VD itself is, uh, you know, sigma on EI is sigma or sigma inverse of EI. Uh, and it contains one invariant subspace, E1 plus E2 up to ED, that is a one-dimensional representation which is sitting inside this VD. And then there is a D minus one-dimensional EREP which is sitting inside this VD as well. So this VD is a direct sum of two representations. So when you take VD tensor VD, you have to take this V0 tensor VH tensor V0 tensor VH. And then you get the V0 from this tensor, this is V0. Uh, and then this V0 tensor VH is VH. This V0 tensor VH is VH. So you get two copies of VH. This is D minus one dimensional, which is inside V. And then you have v, VH tensor VH. And that's some SN group the SD group theory. If you take the hook, uh, the hook is a D minus one dimensional representation which corresponds to this young diagram. D minus one, first row, and length one for the second row. Its dimension is D minus one. And if you take its tensor product with itself, you can get one copy of the trivial, one copy of the H itself, and then something else, which I'm calling V2. It has this uh, D minus two comma one one uh, uh, young diagram. V3 is this one. They have some dimensions. You add them all up. You, you can check that they are d minus one square. So basically, once you say vd tensor vd, the natural thing to do is to decompose it into e reps. What you find is that you get two copies of v zero, uh, one from here and one from here, and then you get three copies of vh, two from here and then one from here again, and then one copy of v two v three from here. So we just <coughs> do all these things that we do as a represent in representation. So here the interesting numbers are 2, 3, 1, 1. So what does that have to do with the 11? So 2, 3, 1, 1. Um, so quadratic invariance. So we need, so basically, first of all, you have uh, two copies of V0. So there are two V0 guys. Three copies of VH. Uh, uh, 
and some copies of B2. A is a, is a state index which goes from 1 to the dimension of the H. Likewise, 1 to the dimension of the H, 1 to the dimension of B2, and so on. So these are basically, what are these? These are the EREPs that appear in DD tensor BD. In other words, there are some linear combinations of MIJs. There are some appropriate linear combinations of MIJs which can be organized into EREPs. Uh, and uh, what are the quadratic invariants? So to build quadratic invariants, once you have an EREP, basically take that EREP tensor itself, you're going to get a quadratic invariant. Uh, but if you have multiple copies of the same EREP, you, have, you can couple the first V0 to the second V0. Uh, and therefore, there's a matrix of couplings between these V0 guys. So basically, you have a 2 by 2 matrix because you have two copies of V0. You have a 3 by 3 matrix because you have three copies of VH, and you have a 1 by 1 and a 1 by 1. And these are symmetric matrices because they're quadratic functions. So these are symmetric things. So what we have now understood is that these 11 quadratic invariants come from uh, two from the V2 and V3, three from the V2s. This, this is the size of a symmetric uh, two by two matrix. There, there are two copies of V0, symmetric two by two matrix. Uh, there are three parameters there. And symmetric three by three matrix, uh, you have six parameters there. So now there's a representation theory way of understanding this 11. Uh, so, and basically, this matrix, this 2 by 2 symmetric matrix of parameters, controls the mixing of these zeros, 3 by 3 symmetric matrix, the mixing of VHs, and the condition for the convergence is just that these are positive definite uh, matrices. Uh, just to make that explicit, uh, the measure, which was the usual Euclidean measure on all the matrix entries, can be written in terms of these new S variables, these are EREP variables. This is a very simple transformation because transforming from the MIJ to these S variables is an orthogonal basis change. This is orthogonal, the you know, depth of the Jacobian is going to be uh, one, so it's just a naive thing. And then you have the Gaussian matrix model, which you have this measure, e to the minus the action, which will be two linear guys, and the linear guys are the V0, and alpha goes from 1 to 2. These are the two linear invariants. And then there's a matrix for the V0 invariants. There is a matrix for the H invariants, lambda H. And there's a, there's, here there was no multiplicity. There was a V2. So you have uh, one parameter. So basically, as long as this parameter is greater or equal to 0, this integral will converge, or at least the correlators will converge. Uh, and you have some positive that semi-definiteness condition on these parameters to make sure that this integral converges. Uh, so from that uh, uh, model, you can calculate what are the linear expectation values of these S variables. Uh, because of permutation invariance, SD invariance, anything which is a non-trivial rep will have linear uh, expectation value zero, but the V zero guys will have some non-zero expectation value, which depends on these parameters. There is a linear thing here and a quadratic thing here. These determine the expectation values of the V zero guys. There's nothing linear in the VH, uh, so these guys are zero. And then in terms of these S variables, the quadratic expectation values are easy to compute, Wick's theorem. Uh, and it's diagonal in these representations, and then you have the matrix, the mix, the inverse of the matrix, uh, mixing matrix, just from doing Gaussian integrals. You have a mixing matrix in the exponent, you get the inverse of that matrix appearing when you calculate the two point functions. Uh, and from that, you can go back to these things we were looking at before MIJ, 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 all these different invariants written in terms of the matrices. The matrices themselves are linear combinations of these S variables, because it was just a change of basis. So you can work these things out in terms of the lambda parameters. Okay. Great. So, so, so I think uh, this uh, 
quadratic expectation values can be computed. Uh, and in, in the applications to data, what you're going to do is take these, all these quadratic invariants along with the linear invariants, same thing as before, use them to determine these lambda parameters, uh, and then uh, use that to go back to the theory, compute the cubic and uh, quadratic invariants, and there's some explicit formulas you can derive. Uh, and uh, the first cubic invariant. As usual, you're just doing you know, a Euclidean integral with a matrix variable, so you're going to use Wick's theorem with some of the contractions. Uh, and since you know the two-point functions, you can work out all these things. Uh, and then the, the, the program is to try and compare this with the data and see if, if it works better than the five parameter one. Uh, so some of the open questions. Uh, we, we gave some formulas of the counting at degree k. It would be nice to know what is the asymptotics of that uh, degree of these sequences, how fast do they grow. Uh, they grow faster than partitions, that is clear, uh, and it would be nice to characterize how growth. It, it looks faster than two matrix, uh, looks somewhat similar to three index. UD invariant tensor models, it's probably it might be the same universality class, would be nice to explore that. Uh, and uh, then, you know, this computational linguistic questions, how well does this Gaussian model account for data? Uh, you could do it with adjectives like, I could, like we discussed, red was an adjective, you could do it with intransitive verbs, uh, and which are also, also correspond to matrices. Uh, the other day over dinner, Antal was asking what, what's the use of two matrix model. Potentially, if you want to study the dis statistics of adjectives and verbs at the same time, you could have one type of matrix for the adjectives, one type of matrix for the verbs. Uh, so this is a, uh, a playground for multi-matrix model. Uh, for, for other, as I said, the, the nature of the thing depends on uh, the, the nature of whether it's a matrix vector or a higher index tensor depends on the grammatical nature. So if you have intransitive verbs, these are three index tensors. And so, so basically there are many generalizations one can contemplate uh, and uh, one can you know, it's kind of motivated by these applications. But yeah, a couple of some more physics inspired questions. So I kind of did zero dimensional Euclidean quantum field theory just by doing this, this SD invariant models. It might be nice to you know, when you think about UN invariant, the zero dimensional models, often they're interesting because they come from one dimensional quantum mechanics or higher dimensional gauge invariant models. Uh, I don't even know how to think about properly about SD gauge invariant quantum mechanics models, but if there's a good definition of these things, it'd be nice to develop that. Uh, uh, there are some papers on this subject, but maybe uh, one has to understand them. Uh, but, uh, so, so yeah, uh, this is something I'd be interested to explore. And uh, you know, here's another large D model. Potentially, it might have similar combinatorics to tensor models. Uh, and one may want to think about whether they're just the holographic duals of these models. So I'll stop here. Will these techniques be useful in outstanding problems in linguistics, like uh, translating linear A or something like that? Like, like what? Translating linear A or something like that. Transcending? Translating linear A. Linear A. What, what, so it's one of these languages that hasn't been deciphered yet. Oh. And if you can find some patterns in uh, how symbols correlate in these languages, yeah. would this help in... Uh... Yeah, but basically, you know, basically this doesn't use much. So, so I, I expect it to have a, potentially can have applications to many different things. Whenever you have, uh, you know, a large collection of matrices or tensors where there's some underlying permutation symmetry, uh, th these uh, models could be useful. So, yeah, it doesn't have to be, you know, could be a strange sort of language as so, long as there's a notion of adjective and, and noun, and, which I imagine there is. Well, you don't know. Yeah. Oh, you don't know. Right. <laughs> oh, I see. Right. So I guess its idea is to, if you have a language you don't know, then you try to make these statistics with some kind of abstract basis. Uh, and then if you do a map between the two things, you have a proposal for what the dictionary is. Yeah. yeah. Well, first you have to decide what is the grammatical. Yeah, you see, here, here one there's the one, you know, there's not much that went in, but there was one thing that words are di distinguished by their grammatical role. 
and nouns versus adjectives. You can identify which are which. So, so at that very basic thing is needed. So, so to be any to do this, we need it with any confidence. Well, so question. Yeah. Have you run different languages through these? Do they? Uh, no, do they no, similar? no, no. We haven't yet, but it's. Uh, some, yeah, very. So this was done in English. Or this was done in English. Yeah. Okay. Just in English. Yeah. But if the results depend on the language, would be kind of. It looks like not very. Well, you see, you, you see, well, you see, what we so we have these thirteen parameters, which are the means uh, and the right. dispersions. What would be nice if sort of similar languages you intuitively think are similar sit somewhere close by in this thirteen-dimensional space, and uh, so so it's kind of, it could be a tool potentially for comparative linguistics. That's a Lagrangian of languages. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. No, absolutely. Yes. The 13 parameter space of languages, yeah. and every language has a point there. Yeah, that's wonderful. But there definitely are languages where the, ad, the you know, adjectives and the verbs are you know, far away from each other, right? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, or, or oh. these five word limits, so you'd have to. Yeah, uh, that's right. I think yeah. when you read German, that's usually not one of the problems that you start. Well, in German, you still have to split the words into the <laughs> decomposable parts. <laughs> So, so I, 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 I have spoken to people, you know, some Japanese physicists who, who were interested in, in applying this to Japanese. They, they felt this framework could, could easily apply to Japanese, and they were interested in thinking about <coughs> adjectives and mm -hmm. you know these kinds of composite things for right. Japanese. So it's, there's some level of universality. Yeah. Right. Any further questions? Okay, let's thank Sanjay again. Should we maybe...